sein. Hello, and welcome to Be Still and Know. Today's video is going to be a continuation of the Ancient Astronaut series, and today's video is going to be features of ancient astronaut theory, mysterious ancient structures built using advanced mathematics, methods, and tools of the Americas, part one. So let's dive right in. Let's go over the ancient astronaut theory again. The definition is sometimes referred to as ancient alien theory. Ancient astronaut theory is the idea that intelligent, self-aware, extraterrestrial, interdimensional, inner-earth dwelling, or even time-traveling beings visited Earth and made contact with humans in antiquity and prehistoric times. Proponents suggest that this contact influenced the development of modern cultures, technologies, architecture, religions, and even human biology. A common position is that deities from most, if not all, religions are extraterrestrial in origin, and that advanced technologies brought to Earth by ancient astronauts were interpreted as evidence of divine status by early humans. So that's our definition. We've been going over that for the last few videos. Today's video, we're going to start off in Costa Rica. So the stone spheres, or las bolas, are in the Isla de Caño, Costa Rica and the stone spheres are an assortment of over 300 petrospheres in Costa Rica. Located in the Diquis Delta and on Isla del Caño, locally they are known as las bolas, literally the balls. The spheres are commonly attributed to the extinct Diquis culture and are sometimes referred to as the Diquis spheres. They are the best known stone sculptures of the Istmo Colombian area. Most of the stone used to sculpt the spheres was found in the foothills of the coastal mountains, far away from where they ended up, leaving some to speculate that they were moved using sound levitation or conveyed by ancient aircraft technology. Mainstream archaeologists claim that they were chipped away and sanded down with abrasives to create a smooth, round surface. Some of the balls have been estimated to be up to 97% spherical. So this is just a kind of weird anomaly that we find in the Americas. I was actually very surprised when I first heard about these, that there are these exactly, almost exactly spherical, um, big huge stones that have been carved down. So it looks like they were sanded down uh, from stones that they had found, and they're up to 97% spherical. So it's amazing how huge those things are. So the next site, um, that we're going to look at is a very similar, uh, I guess, uh, it's not really a site, but it's, a, it's an area where they have also found these other huge stone balls, but they are in Bosnia. So even though this is not in the Americas, I'm just going to quickly go over this really quick. And these are the Bosnian spheres. Uh, they are in Zavodovici, Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Bosnian Stone Sphere Park near the town of Zavodovici, Bosnia and Herzegovina was opened in September of 2006 by the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun Foundation in conjunction with a group of local enthusiasts who recognize the value of the stones and the need to protect them. It is located 80 kilometers north of the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun in Visok. The spheres were discovered in 1936 after a large storm caused heavy runoff in the area that opened the hillside and washed out the estimated 80 stone spheres. Some of the spheres were washed all the way to the Bosna River, but most remained in the area that is now the park. So unlike the uh, Costa Rican uh, Las Bolas, these are not sanded down. Let's go over the uh, way that they were made. In the 1960s and 1970s, many of the spheres were destroyed when a rumor circulated that they had gold inside. Spheres were also taken from the site by collectors. Consequently, today the park is mostly made up of pieces of broken spheres, with only a few remaining intact. The balls ranged in size from several centimeters to as much as 4 meters in diameter and weighed as much as 20 tons. This largest size is based on pieces remaining at the site. The spheres are shiny and very smooth on the outside. Material analysis revealed that the spheres are made of the same material as a local native sandstone but they contain additional materials that are consistent with binding and hardening rock during a geopolymer casting process. So essentially it appears that the spheres were created from powdered or melted local stone mixed with calcium carbonate as a binder and manganese as a hardener, then molded into the sphere shapes. Stone spheres in other parts of the world made of granite and other hard natural stones are typically shaped or sanded into their spherical form. 
but the stone spheres have been discovered in eight different locations in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the stone spheres in the northeastern Bosnia are made of granite, and those in central Bosnia are made of volcanic stone. So this is very strange, unlike the Costa Rica ones, which were huge and they don't know how they moved them. Uh, these ones were actually made of a some kind of a mixture that was like a molded or cast into these shapes and then hardened later. So very strange process for ancient man. All right, and then here is, we're just gonna do some honorable mentions. These are giant spheres that have not been proven to be man-made, but could be naturally occurring uh, and are worthy of an honorable mention. So we have the Cerro Piedras Bola near Jalisco, Mexico. That's a really giant one. We can't really tell if that was man-made or not. The Moraki boulders on a New Zealand beach, uh, those are probably made from uh, erosion, but you never know. And then the volcanic eggs in uh, Shenongjia uh, Nature Reserve Area in Hubei Province, China. This one, this vo these volcanic eggs are also very mysterious. They say that they have weird um, electromagnetic properties, uh, but these also we can't really tell if they are man-made or not. But look at these things, man. They're probably shaped somehow. I don't know if maybe natural causes, but uh, something had to shape these things over time. So. Those are the giant spheres, and we're gonna go back to the Americas, and we're gonna start with uh, Sacsayhuaman, Cusco, Peru. Sacsayhuaman is a citadel on the northern outskirts of the city of Cusco, Peru, the historical capital of the Inca Empire. The stones are so closely spaced that a single piece of paper will not fit between many of the stones. An early Spanish priest claimed that not even a pin could fit between the rocks. Visitors have tried to no avail to slide sheets of paper between the stones. This precision, combined with the rounded corners of the blocks, the variety of their interlocking shapes, and the way the walls lean inward, is thought to have helped the ruins survive devastating earthquakes in Cusco. So look at these structures right here. It just, it's just amazing how they built these, these walls, these huge walls with huge stones, and they didn't even use mortar. They just basically um, fit them into place, and uh, it's kind of a mystery of how they stayed together so tightly for so long even uh, withstanding earthquakes. All right, the longest of the three walls is about 400 meters. They are about six meters tall. The estimated volume of stone is over 6,000 cubic meters. Estimates for the weight of the largest andesite block vary from 141 tons to almost 220 tons, moved from a quarry of 75 miles away. This has led some to believe that the stones were moved using sound levitation. The lack of space between stones suggests they were fitted together using advanced stone masonry technology such as some sort of acid that would dissolve the edges of the stones so they fit together, or a superheating technique that would make the stones malleable enough to be melted and squeezed together and then cooled and hardened. Some of the wall edges appear to have some blocks that are even bent to fit around corners. Following the siege of Cusco, the Spaniards began to use Sacsayhuaman as a source of stones for building Spanish Cusco. Within a few years, they had taken apart and demolished much of the complex. The site was destroyed block by block to build the new Spanish governmental and religious buildings of the colonial city, as well as the houses of the wealthiest Spaniards. Today, only the stones that were too large to be easily moved remained at the site. So, we don't even really know um, what this site really looked like when the, when the Spaniards first encountered it because these, well I don't want to be, you know, historically, have a historical grudge but I, I really could, couldn't stand. When I heard about the, the Spaniards and the conquistadors as a, as a teenager, I really couldn't stand that story. These guys were just bunches of assholes. But anyway, these assholes, they stole all the stones so we don't really know what it looked like before. This, these are just the stones that were too big to move. Luckily, uh, whatever ancient prehistoric society was there um, knew how to make lasting architecture that w would even stand the test of pillagers. So screw the Spaniards again. <laughs> if you're from Spain, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about modern Spaniards, all right? Calm your asses down. All right, let's move to Tiwanaku. And Tiwanaku is a place in Bolivia. It's a complex over there. Tiwanaku, or Tiwanaku, is a pre-Columbian archaeological site in western Bolivia, near Lake Titicaca, and one of the largest sites in South America. Surface remains currently cover around four square kilometers and include decorated ceramics, monumental structures, and megalithic blocks. 
The name by which Tiwanaku was known to its inhabitants may have been lost as they had no written language. Hegarty and Beresford Jones suggest that the Pukina language is most likely to have been the language of Tiwanaku. The age of the site has been significantly refined over the last century. From 1910 to 1945, Arthur Posnaski maintained that the site was 11,000 to 17,000 years old, based on old comparisons to geological eras and archaeoastronomy. In the 1960s, the Bolivian government initiated an effort to restore the site and reconstruct part of it. The walls of the Kalasasaya are almost all reconstructed. The original stones making up the Kalasasaya would have resembled a more Stonehenge-like style, spaced evenly apart and standing straight up. The reconstruction was not sufficiently based on research. For instance, a new wall was built around the Kalasasaya. The reconstruction does not have a high quality of stonework as was present in Tiwanaku. As noted, the Gateway of the Sun, now in the Kalasasaya, is believed to have been moved from its original location. The structures that have been excavated by researchers at Tiwanaku include the Akapana, Akapana East, and Pumapunku step platforms, the Kalasasia, the Keri Kala, and the Putini enclosures, and the semi-subterranean temple. These may be visited by the public today. All right, so look at that's just uh, these are beautiful stone sculptures. I'm sorry that they were they, a lot of them had fallen down and they were moved and re replaced, but. Um, these are just, you can, they stand the test of time. Just look at that. All right, so one place or one um, location on the site is the Akapana. The Akapana is an approximately cross-shaped pyramidal structure that is 257 meters wide, 197 meters broad at its maximum, and 16.5 meters tall. At its center appears to have been a sunken court. This was nearly destroyed by a deep looter excavation that extends from the center of this structure to its eastern side. Material from the looter's excavation was dumped off the eastern side of the Akapana. A staircase with sculptures is present on its western side. Possible residential complexes might have occupied both the northeast and southeast corners of this structure. Originally, the Akapana was thought to have been developed from a modified hill. 21st century studies have shown that it is an entirely man-made earthen mound, faced with a mixture of large and small stone blocks. The dirt comprising Akapana appears to have been excavated from the moat that surrounds the site. The largest stone block within the Akapana, made of andesite, is estimated to weigh 72.4 tons. The structure was possibly for the shaman-puma relationship, or transformation through shapeshifting. Tinan puma and human heads stud the upper terraces. The Akapana East was built on the eastern side of early Tiwanaku. Later it was considered a boundary between the ceremonial center and the urban area. It was made of a thick prepared floor of sand and clay, which supported a group of buildings. Yellow and red clay were used in different areas for what seems like aesthetic purposes. It was swept clean of all domestic refuse, signaling its great importance to the culture. So as you can see here uh, from these two images, the Akapana is basically a huge mound. Uh, it could have been a, a pyramid originally, we really don't know that yet, but it definitely is a man-made mound. So very similar to some of the huge giant earthen mounds found in the Cahokian civilization just to the north in North America. All right, the next site that we have at Tiwanaku is the Pumapunku. The Pumapunku, spelled two different ways, is Aymara and Quechua for cougar door. It is a man-made platform built on an east-west axis like the Akapana. It is a rectangular terraced earthen mound faced with megalithic blocks. It is 167 meters wide along its north-south axis and 116 meters broad along its east-west axis and is 5 meters tall. Identical 20 meter wide projections extend 27.6 meters north and south from the northeast and southeast corners of the Pumapunku. Walled and unwalled courts and an esplanade are associated with this structure. A prominent feature of the Pumapunku is a large stone terrace. It is 6.75 meters by 38.72 meters in dimension and paved with large stone blocks. It is called the Plataforma Litica. The Plataforma Litica contains the largest stone block found in the Tiwanaku site. According to Pons Sanginis, the block is estimated to weigh 131 metric tons. The second largest stone block found within the Pumapunku is estimated to be 85 metric tons. So very huge giant stone blocks. Look at these shapes. Looks like these shapes are almost like molded, like they were molds, because they're so similar. And they're almost perfectly cut. 
Some of these stones are so perfectly cut, the 90 degree angles on the sides can cut your fingers when you run your fingers up and down. It's amazing. This terraced earthen mound was originally faced with megalithic blocks, each weighing several tens of tons taken from a quarry six miles away, up cliffs and down valleys, leaving some to speculate that the stones were moved using ancient advanced technology like sound levitation or tractor beams from aircraft instead of traditional dragging or log rolling. In assembling the walls of Pumapunku, each stone was finely cut to interlock with the surrounding stones and the blocks fit together like a puzzle, forming load-bearing joints without the use of mortar. There are preci precision cuts so accurate, modern stonemasons question whether their own tools could achieve such feats, and are puzzled how an ancient people could possibly perform such stonemasonry without the use of electricity and modern laser-guided cutting tools. Some stones have 90-degree edges sharp enough to cut skin. Some have speculated these structures may have been fashioned by melting stone and molding it into shape in giant molds, and then cooling and placing them together. Interestingly, local indigenous people claim that they did not construct Pumapunku, but that it was built in a single night by visitors from the sky. These sky people stayed for a while and taught the locals certain skills such as agriculture and stonemasonry before leaving the area in flying crafts and destroying a large part of the site. Many stones appear to have fragments and blast damage as if the site was blown up at some point in time. Nearby Ollantaytambo is said to be the village where humans lived and interacted with the sky people. Architecture there, such as the princess bath and the wall of six monoliths, is similar in design and construction to that seen at Pumapunku. So as you can see, the princess bath, this little fountain, has very similar design to some of these other stone blocks that were found at Pumapunku. And the six huge monoliths, or the wall of six monoliths, is these huge stones that are all set together and just like in other places, it's hard to get a piece of paper through them. And they're just huge. So it's amazing how these things are moved and cut. And the fact that it looks like it was destroyed by some kind of blast means maybe this was some kind of extraterrestrial village that was constructed right next to a human village of Ollantaytambo. So you never know. I mean, this is a long time ago. People have their legends, and this is another piece of evidence that a lot of ancient astronaut theorists point to, to um, contact with extraterrestrials in the past. And it is very hard to dispute that these are amazing structures. All right, let's move on to the Kalasasia, which is another structure at Tiwanaku. The Kalasasia is a low platform mound with a large sunken courtyard more than 300 feet long, which is surrounded by high stone walls and outlined by a high gateway. The Kalasasia is about 120 by 130 meters in dimension, aligned to the cardinal directions, and is unique for its north-south rather than east-west axis. The sunken court can be reached by a monumental staircase through an opening in its eastern wall. The walls are composed of sandstone pillars that alternated with sections of smaller blocks of ashlar masonry and incorporates tinon heads of many different styles. This wall has been reconstructed in modern times. It is located to the north of the Akapana and the west of the semi-subterranean temple. The walls covered with tinon heads of many different styles suggest that the structure was reused for different purposes over time. It was built with walls of sandstone pillars and smaller blocks of ashlar masonry. The largest stone block in the Kalasasia is estimated to weigh 26.95 metric tons. So here's an image of the um, Tinan heads. We'll get a better picture in a second. Within the courtyard is where explorers found the gateway of the sun. Since the late 20th century, researchers have theorized that this was not the gateway's original location. These figures are set in three rows and in the center is a deity who has been identified as the staff deity from the Shavin culture, forerunner of the Andean creator god Viracocha. The god holds a staff with condor heads in each hand, identified by some as a spear thrower and arrows, and has a mask-like face, has 19 rays coming from his head, which end in either a circle or a puma head, and is crying, probably to signify rain. Underneath these figures is a row of geometrical designs. Viracocha is said to be a visitor from the stars, capable of flight, who appeared to offer the basic gifts of civilization to the precursors of the Inca people. This image of a bearded pale man has been repeated in cultures worldwide. These legends of Viracocha and his Mesoamerican counterparts, Quetzalcoatl and Kukulkan, told of a benevolent pale bearded god who brought technology and knowledge of civilization to the Americas. 
This led many indigenous American people to initially mistake Spanish conquistadors like Columbus, Cortez, and Pizarro for the semi-defined figure returning, as was foretold in many native legends. This was a crucial mistake that was exploited by the Spanish to their advantage in their conquest of the Americas. Within many of the site structures are impressive gateways. The ones of monumental scale are placed on artificial mounds, platforms, or sunken courts. Many gateways show iconography of the staff god Vida Cocha holding a staff in each hand. This iconography also is used on some oversized vessels, indicating an importance to the culture. This iconography is most present on the Gateway of the Sun, and the Gateway of the Sun and others located at Pumapunku are not complete. They are missing parts of a typical recessed frame known as a chambranle, which typically have sockets for clamps to support later additions. These architectural examples, as well as the recently discovered Akapana Gate, have a unique detail and demonstrate high skill in stone cutting. This reveals a knowledge of descriptive geometry. The regularity of elements suggests that they are part of a system of proportions. So here are some images of the staff god, Viracocha, and Basically, he was, the legend was that he was a, a pale bearded god that came and helped uh, bring civilization to the Americas and agriculture and things like that. And other versions of him would be the feathered serpent deities from uh, northern Mexico. Uh, and those were Quetzalcoatl and Kukulkan. And they had a similar legend of a pale bearded man, but this pale bearded man, instead of holding two staffs, was a feathered serpent. Here is an image of the Tinan heads. Some believe the Tinan heads in the walls of the Kalasasia represent a wall of humanity, or a sort of united nations of different races of men, different beings, and species that could have visited and peopled Earth in the distant past. So here is an image I found from ancientaliens.com uh, that shows that the Tinan heads could have been representations of the Olmec people, the ancient uh, precursors to the Maya and Aztecs. They could be representations of gray aliens, of Anunnaki, elongated head species, Indus Valley people, of other uh, Moai, and looks like the Wangina from Australia. So a lot of different people have attributed these heads as different cultures or different peoples or species that lived on Earth in the past. But that's just a theory. We don't really know that. Here's more images. And here is images of the Gateway of the Sun. As you can see, it was, you know, not put together like it was when they first found it. It was already falling apart. So they have tried to reconstruct it and put it back together. And here is the Gateway of the Moon. And a picture of what it looked like when they first found it. Many theories for the skill of Tiwanaku's architectural construction have been proposed. One is that they used a luka, which is a standard measurement of about 60 centimeters. Another argument is for the Pythagorean ratio. This idea calls for right triangles at a ratio of 5 to 4 to 3 used in the gateway to measure all parts. Lastly, Protzen and Nair argue that Tiwanaku had a system set for individual elements dependent on context and composition. This is shown in the construction of similar gateways ranging from diminutive to monumental size, proving that scaling factors did not affect proportion. With each added element, the individual pieces were shifted to fit together. As the populations grew, occupational niches developed and people began to specialize in certain skills. There was an increase in artisans who worked in pottery, jewelry, and textiles. Like the later Inca, the Tiwanaku had co few commercial or market institutions. Instead, the culture relied on elite redistribution. That is, the elites of the empire controlled essentially all economic output, but were expected to provide each commoner with all the resources needed to perform his or her function. Selected occupations included agriculturalists, herders, pastoralists, etc. Such separation of occupations was accompanied by hierarchical stratification within the empire. The elites of Tiwanaku lived inside four walls that were surrounded by a moat. This moat, some believe, was to create the image of a sacred island. Inside the walls were many images devoted to human origin, which only the elites could see. Commoners may have entered this structure only for ceremonial purposes, since it was home to the holiest of shrines. Alright, so we're going to move on now to from Tiwanaku to the Olmec Heads. 
The Olmec heads have been found in Tabasco, Mexico, Veracruz, Mexico, Retalhuelu, Guatemala, and they have been moved to museums around the area, but uh, some of them are still in their original locations. The Olmec colossal heads are stone representations of human heads sculpted from large basalt boulders. They range in height from 3.8 to 11.2 feet. The heads are a distinctive feature of the Olmec civilization of ancient Mesoamerica. All portray mature individuals with fleshy cheeks, flat noses, and slightly crossed eyes. Their physical characteristics correspond to a type that is still common among the inhabitants of Tabasco and Veracruz. The backs of the monuments are often flat. The boulders were brought from the Sierra de los Tuxlas mountains of Veracruz. Given that the extremely large slabs of stone used in their production were transported over large distances, over 93 miles, requiring a great deal of human effort and resources, it is thought that the monuments represented portraits of powerful individual Olmec rulers. The regional terrain offers significant obstacles such as swamps and floodplains. Avoiding these would have necessitated crossing undulating hill country. So yeah, these stones are huge. These heads, we don't really know how they move them. Another case of most likely uh, sound levitation. Each of the known examples has a distinctive headdress. The heads were variously arranged in lines or groups at major Olmec centers, but the method and logistics used to transport the stone to these sites remain unclear. They all display distinctive headgear and one theory is that these were worn as a protective helmet, maybe worn for war or to take part in a ceremonial Mesoamerican ballgame. The discovery of the first colossal head at Tres Zapotes in 1862 by Jose Maria Melgar y Serrano was not well documented nor reported outside of Mexico. The excavation of the same colossal head by Matthew Sterling in 1938 spurred the first archaeological investigations of Olmec culture. Seventeen confirmed examples are known from four sites within the Olmec heartland of the Gulf Coast of Mexico. Most colossal heads were sculpted from spherical boulders, but two from San Lorenzo, Tenochtitlan, were recarved from massive stone thrones. An additional monument at Tacalic Abaj in Guatemala is a throne that may have been carved from a colossal head. This is the only known example from outside the Olmec heartland. So here are some beautiful images of the stones. Um, and the, the way that they constructed them, it's just gorgeous. Very, very detailed. Dating the monuments remains difficult because of the movement of many from their original context prior to archaeological investigation. Most mainstream archaeologists have dated them to the early pre-classic period, which was 1500 to 1000 BC, with some of the middle pre-classic, 1000 to 400 BC period. However, due to the lack of written records, carbon dating, or skeletal records, some suspect the heads and the Olmec culture may date back even further. Yeah, this, these dates are the traditional archaeology, our, uh, civilization's only been around 6,000 years, dates. If I was to date them, and I'm not an expert in any way, but I would say that they're probably as old as some of the, the older megalithic structures like Stonehenge or the Moai, and they're probably up to 10,000 to 15,000 years old. A lot of those structures have similar um, construction and similar ways that they probably move them. So I'm, I'm guessing that this ancient civilization, the Olmec, was another branch of an ancient civilization or society that existed before the Ice Age, or that was kind of um, starting to decline around the Ice Age. That's just my guess because of the way that they're constructed and the way that they were found in weird places super far from the uh, quarry. The smallest head weighs 6 tons, while the largest is variously estimated to weigh 40 to 50 tons, although it was abandoned and left uncompleted close to the source of its stone. The sheer weight, size, and distance traveled with the stones seems to make another case for frequency or sound vibration levitation technology, where the stones would be tuned to a certain frequency and then levitated to the almost 100 miles to their final locations. In the late 19th century, Jose Melgari Serrano described a colossal head as having Ethiopian features, and speculations that the Olmec had African origins resurfaced in 1960 in the work of Alfonso Medellin Zanil, and in the 1970s in the writings of Ivan Van Sertima. Such speculation is not taken seriously by Mesoamerican scholars, but the similarities between Olmec, African, and Asiatic people is striking, even amongst lay people. So yeah, a lot of people, when they first saw these stones, took this as evidence that an African tribe had lived in the Americas in the ancient past. 
Um, I just think that in the ancient past, a lot of humans were very similar looking and that um, perhaps the early uh, Olmec or the early American uh, people, uh, Native Americans that lived here, the indigenous uh, people that um, their culture kind of sprung up here, uh, were probably very, very closely related to African and um, Pacific Island people that had been traveling the oceans and colonizing different areas. So I think that, you know, a lot of people originally, like they say, came from Africa, but then they traveled through boats and through other ways uh, across the world. And since it was so long ago, these people probably had very uh, closely related features to the original African ancestors that we all came from. So that's what I think anyway, of why they look so uh, Africanized. But I could be wrong. And also, like they said, there are still a lot of people in Mexico and Guatemala that have very similar features to the, these stones. I've met Guatemalan people that have very uh, similar features to these stones with big fleshy cheeks and wider noses and things like, and big lips, you know. So I think that that, uh, it could be a good indication that these people not only uh, have been here for a long time, but they're still around. The old Meg never went away, their culture just declined. Although all the colossal heads are broadly similar, there are distinct stylistic differences in their execution. One of the heads from San Lorenzo bears traces of plaster and red paint, suggesting that the heads were originally brightly decorated. The heads did not just represent individual Olmec rulers, they also incorporated the very concept of rulership itself. Archaeological investigation of Olmec basalt workshops suggests that the colossal heads were first roughly shaped using the direct percussion to chip away both large and small flakes of stone. The sculpture was then refined by retouching the surface using hammer stones, which were generally rounded cobbles that could be of the same basalt as the monument itself, although this was not always the case. Abrasives were found in association with workshops at San Lorenzo, indicating their use in the finishing of fine detail. Olmec colossal heads were finished as in the round monuments with varying levels of relief on the same work. They tended to feature higher relief on the face and lower relief on the ear spools and headdresses. Monument 20 at San Lorenzo is an extensive figure emerging from a niche. Its sides were broken away and it was dragged to another location before being abandoned. It is possible that this damage was caused by the initial stages of recarving the monument into a colossal head, but that the work was never completed. So yeah, these images right here, it looks like um, one of them was a throne recarved into a head, and the other one was a head recarved into a throne. Kind of strange, huh? And then this one on the left, it just shows how much weathering has taken place and just how much time has gone by that these stones have been sitting just in the dirt. All 17 of the confirmed heads in the Olmec heartland were sculpted from basalt mined in the Sierra de los Tuxlas mountains of Veracruz. Most were formed from coarse-grained dark gray basalt known as Cerro Sintepec basalt after a volcano in the range. Investigators have proposed that a large Cerro Sintepec basalt boulder found on the southeastern slopes of the mountains are the source of the stone for the monuments. These boulders are found in an area affected by large lashars, volcanic mudslides, that carry substantial blocks of stone down the mountain slopes, which suggests that the Olmecs did not need to quarry the raw material for sculpting the heads. Roughly spherical boulders were carefully selected to mimic the shape of a human head. The stone for the San Lorenzo and La Venta heads were transported a considerable distance from the source. The flat backs of many of the colossal heads represented the flat bases of the monumental thrones from which they were reworked. Only four of the 17 heartland heads do not have flattened backs, indicating the possibility that the majority were reworked monuments. Alternatively, the backs of many of these massive stone monuments may have been flattened to ease their transport, providing a stable form for hauling the monuments with ropes. Some speculate due to their size and weight, advanced sound levitation and anti-gravity technology or possibly aircraft uh, use was employed for this task. Two heads from San Lorenzo have traces of niches that are characteristic of monumental Olmec thrones and so were de definitely reworked from earlier monuments. So here's some more heads and then we have uh, an Olmec mask, jade mask, and an Olmec statue. That's a really weird little statue. <laughs> so there you go, those are the Olmec heads. Another case of what looks like sound levitation technology. 
All right, so that is the ending of the mysterious ancient structures built using advanced mathematics methods and tools, Americas part one. I will continue uh, another part and part two uh, doing the same area of the world, the Americas, and we're gonna go over even more ancient sites from the, from the Americas. But that's the ending of this part. So remember, uh, if you do like this video and you like uh, this new series that I'm doing on ancient astronaut theory, please support me, please subscribe and like my videos. Um, you can uh, support me through PayPal, through Cash App. Thank you again for joining me at Be Still and Know with Adam. Remember that no matter what comes your way, it's going to be a great day. Thanks again for joining me. I'll see you later.